When one thinks of right-wing politics outside of the United States, perhaps the most common image to come to mind is monarchy, theocracy, or perhaps thoughts might turn to mid-20th century dictatorships, ideologies of fascism, and the like. But in the United States, conservatism is complicated. In fact, the whole nomenclature of left, right, conservative, liberal, democrat, republican is extremely confused. And we go over that a bit in this video here and talk more extensively about the evolution of American ideology in our Seven Ages of America series. But today we're going to explain why in the United States conservatives have so aggressively opposed the use of government power and big government in general. Hello audience, Mr. Z here with another video for you. If you're new to the channel, welcome. We have videos like this every week, so be sure to subscribe and stay tuned. Before we go any further, I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone who's donated to us on Patreon, Utreon, and right here on YouTube through channel memberships. Your donations really go a long way to keeping this channel going, and by donating to us across any of these platforms, you'll get access to some great perks including physical merch, a custom designed flag wallpaper, and access to an exclusive members only Discord server where you can enter your scenarios for a chance to have them made into full videos. You can follow the pop-up on screen here, go to the comment section or description to visit any of these pages and support our channel, and of course you can do so by clicking the join button right below this video. If you can't donate anything, consider subscribing and sharing this video to help the channel out. Now, back to the video. In America, the small government conservative owes his origins to the ideology first brought to prominence in the United States by President Thomas Jefferson. Prior to Jefferson, political power within the United States was vested in the hands of a small, educated, wealthy, and religiously Anglican coastal and northeastern population. These Federalists sought the creation of a centralized and hierarchical United States, one which followed closely the traditional order structures of Britain, but which rather than allocate power through inherited titles and rights, would function on a meritocratic basis, where power would belong to an aristocracy of virtue, a concept even Jefferson himself came to embrace to a degree after his presidency. Jefferson most famously broke Federalist influence in the United States, shifting power away from the Northeast and coastal communities to the agricultural and southern communities through capitalizing on populism and encouraging greater political participation from the farmer class. While the Federalists had interpreted the Constitution as an outline for federal functions, Jefferson as a social liberal of his day and a believer in Enlightenment principles had placed greater emphasis on the Bill of Rights and the restriction of the federal government, seeking supremacy of the local state governments over the central government and the promotion of greater individual liberty. This stemmed from Jefferson's belief in fostering the farming class into a population of ideal American men, fully self-sufficient and sovereign individuals who, when given the reins of power, would create a truly free and prosperous society. Jefferson's success in advocating such positions is in great part owed to the ideological and demographic transformation that was occurring within the young country. Since the early 1700s, the Baptist faith had been spreading like wildfire among the commoner populations of the South, a faith which, unlike the hierarchical structure of Anglicanism, was highly decentralized, individual-focused, and in a powerful way, very democratic. Baptist preachers were often of very humble backgrounds and did not require the same institutional authority a leader within the Anglican Church would. This complemented the nature of Southern life at the time and further ingrained a sense of individualism within rural American Southerners and a heightened sense of personal responsibility. This is not even mentioning the impact of literature during this period which specifically took aim at opening more conservative rural populations to Enlightenment ideals. It's no secret that during the War for Independence the Southern colonies were strongholds of loyalism and even prior to this during the English Civil War it was the Southern colonies that were hubs of royalist support. Perhaps one of the single most consequential pieces of literature to change this was Thomas Paine's Common Sense, whose radical words in common English of the day encouraged a great deal of the southern commoner population to not look at the revolution as a mere battle for independence as many northerners had, but as a struggle for freedom against tyranny, further building the moral framework of the agricultural and Baptist South. The rapidly growing population of Baptists in the South took to Jefferson's ideals quickly and by the mid-1800s the dominant ideology of the United States had been small government, agrarian, free trade, and territorially expansionist, all of which served to benefit the southern farmer lifestyle primarily but still saw wide appeal even in a number of northern states. What was once the radical ideology of the country had become the establishment, and for many it became the foundations of what it meant to be American, and because of its heavy emphasis upon the rural lifestyle, the social values of the region progressed slowly and became relatively conservative, but still held up democracy as an ideological ideal. This would sow the seeds for the United States to become an especially democratic nation in thought despite its constitutional framework being built on the model of a representative republic. And this is peculiar because democratism was not something typically championed by a nation's rural sectors, with key exceptions being states with widely heterogeneous populations. Rather, countrysides across the world for much of history supported strong central authority, and though that seems outrageous to many Americans today, there was sound logic behind it. Rural areas were dangerous, harsh, and often suffered from scarcity. 
Leadership which could enforce swift law and order in these communities that was favorable to the local population could easily win the area's favor. Rural folk have also historically needed focus more on their own lot than those of others. The minutiae and hassle of elections and politics were luxuries that took time away from providing for the family and were seen as better suited to seasoned politicians. And of course, by the very nature of rural areas and their lacking infrastructure, a strong central government still allowed for ample flexibility in these communities. More than anything, a powerful central government led by a powerful ruler simply meant that mostly just the developed parts of the country would be kept on a tighter leash. While in more remote areas of the country, a noble or representative from the region familiar with its culture and values would be placed in charge by the king to rule the locality for him in a way that was favorable to the locals. And with all that in mind, it should come as no surprise that when time for change in the United States finally came, the man who the most rural parts of the country rallied around was General Andrew Jackson, a political strongman who embodied all those qualities of both an authoritative leader and a democratic politician. But it is also because of this that we see why rural communities and democracy don't often mix. For it was because of Jackson and the very ideology of the South that the loss of their power became inevitable. Jackson would lead the charge to further democratize the country by abolishing the requirement of owning land to vote. With this bulwark gone in the name of the South's ideological vision, they assured that the rapidly growing populations of the northern cities would ultimately surpass those of the South, and with that, so too would power shift away from the rural South to the urban North. The Republican Party soon emerged as a northern-focused party which, in opposition to the southern-focused Democratic Party, favored a strong centralized government, protectionism, and industry. Moreover, as the more thoroughly industrialized and more developed northern states advanced technologically at a faster rate than those of the South, so too did they grow more socially liberal at a faster pace, and this was reflected by the Republican Party itself. The foremost social issue of the day was of course the issue of slavery and the need for its resolution. The socially conservative South argued the constitutionality of the practice and of the right of the states to continue the practice until they themselves decided to resolve it. The question of how to resolve slavery was a major conundrum for Southerners, as while some in the Deep South did seek the expansion of slavery to new states, most simply did not feel that there was a simpler expedient solution at the time. Abolitionists within the socially liberal states of New England, however, as per their name, demanded not merely containment of slavery or gradual emancipation, but immediate abolition, which for the South had worrying social, economic, and political implications, which the abolitionists, being so far removed from the circumstances of the South, could not understand. The South would of course secede following the victory of Lincoln in the election of 1860, as despite Lincoln's moderate position compared to other Republicans, his victory without carrying a single southern state had signaled to many in the South that political domination by the North was inevitable. While slavery had been a key contributor to southern secession, the sheer difference of interest between the North and the South by this point in time and the traditional belief in local authority held high by southerners would also be major drivers for their independence. It's telling that rather than attempt to overthrow Lincoln and the Republican government, something which despite the odds against them would have allowed them to maintain the whole country, the southern states, in line with their belief in self-determination, instead sought to go their own way, being so willing to discard the whole of the United States for the local communities with which they were familiar. Of course, the South would be defeated, reintegrated, briefly disenfranchised, and this experience would drive the Southerners to become highly prideful, in-group focused, and more socially conservative, remaining skeptical of the Republicans for decades to come. The South, since the cementing of its authority and the authority of Jeffersonian ideals in the country, had embodied the leading school of socially conservative thought in America by this point in time, and while traces of that would continue within and beyond the South, for the next few years a new ideological path would dominate American politics. A relatively liberal school of thought founded by the Republicans, but which would eventually develop a conservative faction of its own. With the South politically ostracized, what followed was the heyday of American big government, continuing nearly uninterrupted for roughly a century, and even seeing the South return as a prominent political force during the New Deal era, voting in favor of FDR on the basis of loyalty to the Democratic Party, while other agricultural non-Southern states emerged as a new small government bloc with social values fairly similar to those of the South, albeit one which held no loyalty to the Democrats, opposed foreign intervention, and saw greater support for economic progressivism. By the time of the Progressive Era, a faction of Republicans would have witnessed an increasingly activist government in addition to seeing the United States take on a more active role in foreign affairs, and would seek to keep the country focused on domestic matters instead, and dial back government involvement in regulation, thus creating the early conservative faction of the Republican Party, which was skeptical of labor unions, pro-business, anti-immigrant, protectionist, and non-interventionist. In this regard, the South opposed the northern brand of conservatism, with Southerners having become among the most pro-war hawkish regions of the country. In contrast, the Midwest was highly non-interventionist and protectionist, New England was economically laissez-faire but pro-intervention, and the Plains were non-interventionist and economically progressive. Clearly a mixed bag and one which held little to no power throughout the New Deal era, however we can see here the pieces of the puzzle that would soon form a bigger picture. 
New England and supporters of laissez-faire economics opposed government regulations on business. The Midwest supported government protections for industry, but began to feel that government intervention in the economy was going too far, and opposed the federal government's increasing foreign focus, as did the states of the Great Plains. The seeds of anti-government sentiment were being sown independent of the South, but for a slew of different reasons. Regardless, eventually this would allow for a resurgence of Southern-style small government conservatism. While the South during this time supported the government's foreign intervention and tolerated big government policy aimed at economic reform as this largely only impacted areas outside of the South, once that policy crept into social reform via the federal enforcement of civil rights, the Solid South began to break in their loyalty to the Democratic Party. Southern conservatives once again felt caught in the crosshairs of federal power and thus doubled down hard on their opposition to big government. Recognizing the rising dissatisfaction with government power, Republican figures like Barry Goldwater, Richard Nixon, and Ronald Reagan, influenced by the small government tradition of the South, would take these various conservative factions and bring them together under a single umbrella, promising to end the overstepping of federal authority and bring the country back to an era of small government. New England, the Midwest, the Plains, and the South would all see regulations on businesses and the influence of unions cut back. The role of the federal government in state affairs was scaled down, the South and New England would both revel in the increase in free trade and in the flexing of American might overseas, and of course to consolidate rural appeal, Reagan placed a massive emphasis on evangelical Christian values. Through a union of both Republican and Democratic conservative factions, the Republican Party had redefined itself in the wake of the big government New Deal era as the small government option. All of this came at a time when the great enemy of the United States was the big government Soviet Union. Not to mention the preceding conflict of World War II, which the United States framed as a conflict of democracy and freedom against fascism and tyranny. All of this allowing for the further framing of a big government as undemocratic, unpatriotic, and un-American. And as New Deal-style policies grew unviable, so too did the Democratic Party begin embracing similar positions to the Republican Party, albeit retaining a stance on welfare programs and increased taxation to fund said programs. Thus came the era of neoconservatism and neoliberalism. Over time, however, the focus on foreign policy would cost the Republican Party the support of the industrial Midwest, who now not only saw a toll being taken on foreign conflicts, but began suffering economically as the abandonment of protectionist economics crippled the region's manufacturing base. Likewise, as both parties grew economically liberal, New England found the social conservatism of the Republican Party increasingly unpalatable and swung to the Democratic Party with whom their socially liberal values aligned. Today, the base of the Republican Party's strength remains the most rural of those great plain and southern states, most especially those with large evangelical populations. Following the traditions left behind by Jefferson and the Baptist South, these populations by and large attempt to keep to themselves and have, either on principle or through force of habit, continued to oppose the use of government power even for their own benefit, with perhaps the greatest extent of power implemented being to simply veto the policies of the Democratic Party. And what's touted as the greatest recent victory for conservative Republicans, the overturning of Roe v. Wade, is a perfect example of this. Not the implementing of a new conservative regulation, but simply winding something back. Just like the conservatives of the South in the mid-1800s, the conservatives of today have a tendency to coast on the infallibility of anti-authority ideals and the country's ability to self-correct if simply wound back or downsized. And much as with Jackson's expansion of the franchise, modern conservatism's willingness to do little with government power essentially assures the success of their opposition. Even still, we see a doubling down on small government policy and the use of federal power commonly being decried by conservatives as socialistic, a remnant of the Cold War equivalating of big government policies with the Soviet Union, and something which has become counterintuitive as Republicans paradoxically call for both small government and law and order in the same breath. However, this does appear to be slowly changing in recent years, especially following the rise of Trump-style republicanism, and we talk about that more in this video here. But what do you think? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. The US of Z thanks for watching, Mr. Z, out.